We're going to move on and get the father of the internet online. Unbelievable. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? The father of the internet. This is a brilliant human being that we've been blessed to have here this morning. And so we want to give our audience, the, 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 the people that are working uh, with Silicon Harlem and supporting us and doing a lot of things, uh, to have you just sort of address us, give us some ideas. What should we be thinking about this notion of advancing humanity as we look at the way the world is going um, and sort of how you're looking at things moving forward? Well, thanks so much, Clayton. What a pleasure to meet you face to face this way, although I had intended yeah. uh, to come and, and be there physically. And as you know, that didn't work out because of COVID-19, but we'll yeah. get there eventually. So let me bring you greetings from the Marconi Society, which I chair, and from Google, which is proud to be among the sponsors of today's event. Uh, I could listen to the students all day. I just love the creativity and energy and enthusiasm that, uh, that we got in just those two samples. I also wanted to tell you, after I got a chance to look at the program, I'm sitting here being very unhappy because my calendar is not going to let me stay longer than my time to chat. But my God, friends like Merlin Hayes and Prince Constantine and Craig Newmark and Larry Irving and you know, a whole bunch of other people that I haven't met and would like to, but I'm told that this is going to be recorded. So I will promise you I'm going to go listen to the whole shebang uh, once I get a chance. So let me turn to the things that are on my mind right now and surely on everyone else's. COVID-19 has, uh, has really exposed some serious fissures in our social, economic, and technological worlds. And I believe that we should take advantage of the spotlight that this uh, pandemic has uh, provided us, despite all of the horrible things that have happened, the lost lives and illnesses and the economic stress and everything else, uh, you know, don't let a crisis go to waste. Let's take advantage of what we are seeing and learning uh, from this experience and let's turn it to uh, utility. So uh, as an example of the kind of things that I believe the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed is, uh, uh, the way in which healthcare is, uh, is undertaken. I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, I would call my doctor to try to make an appointment. And he said, don't come into the office because uh, we don't have adequate uh, protection. Uh, I'm happy to do a video chat with you. And I'm sitting here thinking, what kind of medicine is that? I mean, you didn't get my blood pressure or my temperature or my uh, pulse and all the other things that you normally expect from an office visit which led me to conclude that there is a big opportunity in developing what we'll call the internet of medical things. Everybody's heard of IOT, internet of things, but the internet of medical things looks like a big opportunity, creating devices that will allow people to um, uh, obtain a kind of remote office visit by having at least um, uh, measurement of these various important parameters. And at some point, perhaps we even uh, might get even more elaborate diagnostic capability, including things like being able to test for COVID and have an electronic ability to transmit that data back to, um, to the doctor. Uh, just like we could imagine having heart rate uh, mechanisms on your watch uh, as, as an example. So there are big opportunities, I think, in healthcare that are opening up uh, part or our eyes are opening up to opportunity because of that. I think the other thing, which is pretty obvious, is what we're doing right this moment, uh, and that's an alternative to travel. And although I personally much prefer to be up there in New York with you, uh, this is not a bad substitute. And I have to admit that uh, these days, since I've been in my basement office, which is where I am right now for the last seven months, uh, I've been able to travel to Australia and Austria on the same day and then be home in time for dinner. And of course, the, the ability of the internet to sustain this kind of two-way high bandwidth communication is frankly quite surprising. I suppose as we think about the amount of streaming video that was becoming so popular over the last five to 10 years that uh, this increase in capacity uh, worked in both directions. So uh, we're all taking advantage of this uh, astonishing uh, increase in capacity that the internet has, uh, has uh, managed to achieve. Um, I, I want to, uh, I don't have time to go through everything here, but I want to emphasize uh, how important it is for us to look at the uh, social uh, and economic impact 
that uh, the COVID-19 has uh, highlighted. And also, I think, the side effects of social media. Now, the thing that you heard from both of our students is the value of social media, Instagram, uh, for example, in drawing attention to themselves and their work and their, and their businesses. But I think everyone on this call would also appreciate that that same platform, not just Instagram, but all the various social media uh, can be and has been seriously abused. The propagation of misinformation, disinformation, and divisive discourse uh, has been obvious. And we are going to have to do something about that if we don't want to lose the value that those media have provided to us to connect people together, to discover each other and common interests. But at the same time, we have to find ways of making sure that these don't become uh, serious detriments to uh, our social stability. That is not an easy challenge and it is not solvable purely by technology. Uh, I'd like to argue that some wetware up here might help. Critical thinking would be very useful. I mean, think about where did this stuff come from? Is there any corroborating evidence for the assertions that are being made? Is someone trying to convince me of something for some purpose for which I might not agree? There are just a variety of uh, rationales for wanting to cope with and, uh, and essentially uh, un undermine the harmful effects of some of these online environments. Uh, you know, that doesn't even get to the other big problem, which is malware uh, and uh, you know, the propagation of ransomware and all the other kinds of interferences that happen. And I can hear somebody thinking, why the hell didn't you make a more secure system when you designed this 40 years ago? And the answer is we didn't have the technology available to do as good a job of it as we can now. And so there are technologies available and we can improve the implementation of them. But we also need to encourage uh, better behavior by the people that use the system. I mean, a lot of this is uh, of the problems you see are choices that humans make mm -hmm. that are not necessarily in your best interest. So I want to move over to a, an observation about software because I will bet that a great many people who are thinking about what to do right now and are, are kind of forced into thinking, how do I do this online? will recognize that software is an endless frontier. Right. And, I mean, there just you, there isn't anything that you can't do with software as long as you can figure out how to program it. Mm -hmm. you can't figure out how to program it. It's a different problem. But <laughs> the point here is that there is just an infinite set of opportunities here. Uh, and if you can't program, it's okay. Find somebody else who can and then get your idea in place. And that's a big opportunity for lots mm -hmm. of people. However... There is also a big issue here, and I draw your attention to it because I believe it deserves a substantial amount of research, and that is that software is not perfect. It has bugs. What are bugs? Bugs are mostly mistakes that programmers make. And I know I used to make a living writing software, and I have a little dent in my forehead from the millions of times when I've done, ah, how can I do such a dumbass thing? So we have bugs in the software and they get exploited by, by people who don't have your best interest at heart. Yeah. We, need, we need to find ways of avoiding the mistakes. We need better software uh, development environments. We need tools that will help us uh, discover what those problems are. And I challenge the research community, the computer science community to give us much better tools. Not only that, but even after we release software, there are gonna be times when we have to fix the bugs that we found. And that means that if somebody is selling you a box full of software, the first question you should ask is, if there's a bug, can you fix it remotely? Can you fix right. it after I've you know, started to use and rely on this thing? So we are increasingly reliant on software doing what it's supposed to do. And we need to work very hard to make sure that uh, when it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, we can fix it. So that's you know, sort of a you know, the broad brush observation about software. Uh, we are becoming very dependent on it. Yes. Or we need to be very thoughtful about uh, that dependency and, uh, and uh, protecting ourselves and others. Uh, the last point I wanted to make is about telecommunication. We're using right now optical fiber, radio and Wi-Fi and a variety of other things. You know, there may even be some people who are joining us by satellite links. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to draw your attention to some additional new technologies that are coming along. One of them uh, is from a company called Loon, which is one of the Alphabet companies, yep. sister mm -hmm. of Google. 
It's balloons at 65,000 feet <laughs> in the stratosphere delivering LTE, 4G, and someday 5G uh, possibilities. And those things are literally free-flying balloons that are in literally low orbit, very low Earth, Earth orbit, uh, and they keep them uh, aligned based on the winds that are blowing up at that altitude. Uh -huh. Just recently, just a, a week and a half ago, another thing called Hapsmobile <clears throat> was tested. This is a, a an airplane that's solar-powered. It's like a 250-foot wingspan. It takes a few hours for it to get up to 65,000 feet, which is where it flies. And again, using balloon-based radio systems, uh, we tested it uh, with a, with a, a four-way video conference call with Tokyo and London and Washington, D.C. Uh, and, uh, and San Francisco, all being connected with high res like you're seeing right this moment. So we're starting to see some pretty interesting atmospheric level um, uh, communications technologies coming along. And then, of course, there's uh, Elon Musk and others who are putting satellites in low Earth orbit. The Starlink system, uh, if it uh, is actually installed at full uh, capacity, will have 24,000 satellites in orbit up there. Wow. Uh, that means that there won't be any square inch of the Earth that can't be reached uh, by Internet. And that means that getting access to the Internet is inescapable. <laughs> it's going to be there now it still remains to be seen what the performance of the system is what the costs are uh, and that raises uh, one last point i wanted to make generally about internet access my job at google as the chief internet evangelist is to try to get more people connected to the internet all around the world and what we're discovering is there are technology limitations there are cost limitations uh, there are um you know in technical uh challenges uh, atmospheric and uh, and local conditions that uh, get in the way of various alternative choices, depending on the frequencies uh, that you're using. So we have a, a ways to go to get everybody up and running. But these new technologies will help, assuming that they deliver on their promise. So I can tell you that for the rest of the day, uh, just looking at the program, if you don't come out of the end of this day with bursting with ideas for things to do, I'll be very surprised. <laughs> I, can't, I can't wait to see the videos. I thank you so much, Clayton, for letting me take part in this at, at the beginning of the day. Uh, and believe me, I want to wish uh, the, the Silicon Harlem every possible success. This is just so good to see. So keep at it. We're, thank we're, you so we're much. behind you. Thank you so much. And let me just quickly one just say there's so much conversation going on around your, um, you know, your remarks. And I hope you do look at that because there's a um, just so many different ideas that have come out of just from what you shared with us. Uh, when Mike talked with Merlin, he reflected on a cab ride that you had with him. So I don't know if you remember that, but that was uh, fun to hear. So just a big thank you from us. I hope we get to do this again. Vince Surf, because you're, you're you threw out a lot of things that we ha now have to really sort of break down on our side. Uh, internet access is our number one thing, um, but I thank you again for sharing your expertise and and just being a part of this. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Good luck to everybody, and I'll see you on the net. You got it. <laughs> All right, uh, and we're gonna keep the agenda moving. Uh, so very excited about uh, all of this, and I hope all, everyone is, and I know my video looks a little crazy. We're going to fix that as we go. Uh, but we're, I believe, we are about ready for our next um, speaker. And I don't see the video, but I'm assuming that uh, our, there's one, listen, everyone, one, all right, hey, whoa, hang on a second. Five people on Earth, five people on Earth control the all communications of the United States. And we got one of those five people this morning. And I am so excited because in, in October of 2016, she was our keynote speaker. And, and her speech was the homework gap. The homework gap, right? We were all fascinated and loved it. And since then, she's been pushing so many different initiatives around broadband. 
writing so many different types of policies, and we're all be- very, very supportive of what Commissioner Rosenworcel has done in her career. But here we are, four years later, right? Four years later, Commissioner, what has changed? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Thank you so, so much, Clayton, for that introduction, for having me here. Um, what has changed? Gosh, four years ago, it was like the before times, right? We could meet in person. That, it was well, that's um, a big difference, yes. <laughs> it's a big difference. Uh, so what's changed? Uh, you know, I came before you four years ago and said we have this big problem in the nation's digital divide, which is we got to really focus on the fact that not all of our kids are connected because homework is different than when I was growing up. You know, I needed paper or pencil and my brother leaving me alone. Today, seven in 10 teachers assign homework that requires internet access, but all the FCC data show one in three households don't have broadband. And where those numbers overlap, I started calling the homework gap around the time that I joined you in Sil- at Silicon Harlem, because I felt like this part of the digital divide needed, needed special definition because it was especially cruel. So here we are in this pandemic that has um, crashed our economy, it's emptied our streets, it's filled our hospitals. And we have sent millions and millions of students home and told them, go, go to do remote learning, go to online class. But kids who don't have internet access at home, who fall into the homework gap, well, they're locked out of the virtual classroom. And so during this crisis, I'm worried this homework gap is fast becoming an education gap, and it's going to be a long-term opportunity gap. I think mm. as a nation, we have got to make it a priority to get every student connected. Leave no child offline. Mm, mm, mm. Well, you know, uh, uh, you, I couldn't agree more with you. We've been hit hard here in Harlem, obviously, with that very notion. And we're finding that, you know, between the idea of, of very few jobs, uh, businesses falling apart, uh, their parents are suffering and the kids are suffering, which is creating a, a real gap of opportunity. So I think the work that you're doing now, uh, trying to address this issue is exactly what we need. And Silicon Harlem's, you know, cer- certainly behind that. And it's our number one initiative, if you will, as a company is to close the gap of connectivity. You know, it impacts not only just education, but work and health and everything else. So I'm you so excited it. that you're still at the wheel here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, um, I'm going to be relentless. We, yes. here's the thing as a nation, we've got to decide that we have a 100% policy, 100% of us connected to broadband, 100% of us online. We did it before with basic telephony. We did it with rural electrification. We've done it with water. We as a nation need to think about 100%. And you know, the thing that gets me a lot about what this administration has done with the digital divide is we have focused almost singularly on getting rural America connected, that's important. We've got lots of communities that are gonna be left behind if they don't get the infrastructure to have Mm -hmm. access to broadband. But there's another part of it, which is three to four times as many households in urban and suburban communities are not connected to the internet reliably and consistently. Mm. And to me, that's an important part of the digital divide and we've got to solve that too. Well, let me, let me ask you a question. What, what is the, what is the focus right now? I know yours, but overall the FCC, what are you guys focused on given this pandemic? What are some of the things and that are evolving as, as you see it? Well, at the, you know, in the early days of this pandemic, the agency came up with a program it called Keep America Connected. And the idea was this, we were gonna see some job losses and some hardship. So what we were going to do was make sure that our nation's broadband companies would waive late fees and wouldn't shut consumers off. And to the extent they had private Wi-Fi available, they were gonna make that available more publicly. These these were, by the way, good things. And um, hundreds and hundreds of broadband providers across the country and wireless carriers and and, uh, those that offer voice service signed up for it. Really good stuff. The problem is here we are, what, seven months, you know, I've lost count, (laughs) so many months in. And 
that um, that commitment has fallen by the wayside. And what I'm worried about now, as we see more people lose their jobs, slip into poverty, that we're going to find these services are cut off. And broadband's no longer nice to have. It's need to have. Your kid needs it for school. There are a lot of jobs where you can keep working if you have it at home. And there are a lot of healthcare providers who want to see you online because it's safer, easier, and more cost effective. We got to figure out how they all stay connected, no matter what's happening in our world, what's happening in our communities. And so figuring out a way to keep those pledges moving and keep everyone connected is important. A lot of companies have made commitments on this, and we they frankly they deserve a lot of our praise. But it's just exposed a much bigger problem, which is not everyone's online and we're losing something in this country. I mean, our like civic and commercial genius is bigger than the community that's connected right now. How do we expand it? How do we get to 100 percent? That's really at the top of my mind. I love that. We believe that, too. We also believe it should not be. It should not be the barrier of cost. That's that's something that we have noticed to be um, plaguing a lot of the low income areas, uh, mm-hmm. folks that are on fixed incomes, our seniors and and others. And we believe that there's there's there there will be a time, uh, hopefully in in our lifetime, uh, where it is accessible to everyone. As you're saying, the hundred percent is absolutely. Uh, going to only help all of us. There is no zero sum game here. It, it actually helps all of us. Um, so just looking at what some of the questions people are asking, by the way, I don't know if you're able to see some of the questions, but there's a lot of people very much interested in what you're talking about. What I'd like to ask is um, when it comes to technology in and of itself and the notion of what we're trying to do with this particular summit, which is we went from last year talking about some really heavy duty tech stuff, quantum computing and space. We were like all over the place. <laughs> and this year and literally October of 2019, we put the theme together for 2020 to be advancing humanity. And boy, is it more appropriate than we ever thought it would be, you know, it, uh, the, you know, so, so what does advancing humanity mean to you in the prism of communications and technology? Um. You know, it's inter- I, I like your theme, Advancing Humanity, because I often find these discussions toggle between this um, techno-dystopianism and techno-optimism. Yeah. And the way that I see it is, look around. We've got problems to solve. Mm. You know, um, mm. we got communities that are having difficulty navigating the digital age. How do we use technology to solve those problems? Right. I want to be driven by the technology. I want to see it as a tool and a tool that can be used to solve problems that affect us as communities. Mm. You know, how do we make ourselves healthier? How do we anticipate wildfires before they start out west? How do we make sure every kid is connected? How do we make sure our traffic signals are a little more adaptable so people, when they're in their cars, when we go back places and do more things indoors, can get where they need to go faster and waste less time commuting? I just feel like those things are near-term accessible when we think about using communications differently than just being phone centric. Can we put sensors on a lot of infrastructure that we have? Can we make, um, can we get more people connected? There's a lot of stuff we can solve. And to me, that's what advancing humanity means. It's not starting with technology. It's starting with what problems we have, what resources are constrained and how technology can help us strengthen our communities. Well, I certainly love what you're saying. It it, it aligns with what we believe here at Silicon Harlem and I've been all, I've had the good fortune to travel the entire world around the idea of smart cities, et cetera. And we don't tip, typically use the term smart cities, right? We, we call it tech enabled. And the reason is exactly as you described, we, we're looking for ongoing efficiency. How do we make our cities more efficient? Our offices, our homes, et cetera. How do we yeah, make more livable, more livable, right? Like we're exactly. looking to enhance life. We're not looking to, um, make, yeah, that's just really important to me. Like how do we use it to enhance our day-to-day life and not just for some segment of a city for everyone. It, it has to be inclusive. And, you know, when we look at, uh, you know, New York city particularly, but you know, cities all around this country, uh, we look at, uh, and, and this may be FCC commissioner, 
I, I'm not saying for you to say anything like this, but I believe there's another divide coming, another digital divide. And if you and I can get together and say, hey, we know what the next digital divide is, perhaps, perhaps we could we could actually preempt it, right? So if you, it, it, it's exactly what we're talking about. I believe that right now, most digital divides are defined by two things, whether it's a cost issue or you don't know about it. That's what really creates this divide. And I believe that the next digital divide, because I know that's what the question everyone on this call would want to hear, Clayton, what are you talking about? <laughs> the answer is, is uh, the smart city, smart office, smart home, tech enabled, everything is coming on fast and, 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 uh, and it's going to be the same two things. Do you know about it? And can you afford it? So I think we should think about how do we, at minimum, why I have this summit, why we do these meetups and conversations is to make sure communities know what's coming. And second, we want to work with the industry to make sure that it's accessible. So that might be something to think about um, in, in some of the meetings that you'll have, you know, moving forward that we can, we can avoid the next digital divide. Right, right. I completely agree with what you just said. Absolutely, from front to back. Okay, put me down on a certificate or something. But anyway, <laughs> just uh, I'm uh, so anyway. On another note, um, what's happening with with um, the you know current telecommunication infrastructure uh, as it looks from rural, tribal lands, urban yeah. markets? What? How do you look at that these days? Well, I think that. Um, the digital divide has these two parts. We've got a deployment challenge and we've got an adoption challenge and you don't solve it, you don't fix it unless you address both. With respect to deployment, the FCC's official statistics say that 18 million people in this country don't have access to broadband because the infrastructure's not there. They're largely in rural and remote areas. Um, I think that 18 million wildly understates <laughs> where service is and is not. There are other estimates out there that are 42 million. There are estimates that are even higher. And that's because the FCC uses this mapping methodology, which assumes that if there's a single subscriber in a census block, then we think that there's services available throughout. So it, it systematically overstates service. So I think we have a rural America problem that is acute. And we're going to need to look at what history delivered with the Rural Electrification Act and start building off of similar models Mm -hmm. to make sure remote communities are connected. And then I think when it comes to urban and suburban areas, we're gonna have to take a hard look about why people are not connected. And you mentioned affordability. I think that's a huge issue. And yet year mm -hmm. in and year out, when the FCC produces its broadband report, it kind of ignores it, it skates over it. Mm -hmm. And it just seems to me, if you wanna to get to 100%, you're gonna have to understand that affordability issue. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's the fact of a recurring contract. Sometimes it's um, uh, not being aware of adoption or not seeing the value proposition. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's households that might have some access, but that access is data capped and it constrains what they can do. We have really got to tease apart what those affordability issues are and who they affect in our population and then come up with targeted proposals to solve them. I mean, this stuff has been done before. In 1985, when President Reagan was in the White House, we started a program called Lifeline. Mm -hmm. Get every household mm -hmm. connected to basic telephony because we kind of figured out they weren't going to have a fair shot in the modern world without having a phone line. Right, right now, I just think um, the dial tone of the digital age is internet access. Mm -hmm. So let's just borrow what's been done before and reshape Lifeline to meet this moment. So low-income households have a shot too. And it's not just, you know, it's not just work. It's education for their kids. It's healthcare. It's really staying in touch with every service that you could need. And um, we got to start, stop looking at it as like a luxury good, uh, nice to have. It, it's fundamentally need to have if you want a fair shot today. Yeah, we certainly believe that. Well, I, I, I have one sort of question for you as you look towards the future, right? So if you look towards the future and you had your druthers, we've talked about everyone having 100% connected, mm -hmm. but, you know, I worked really hard with the NDIA and others around, you know, getting 
lifeline for broadband. And we had some success with that, but I, I, the more I thought about it, the more I was concerned about speed, for example, mm -hmm. as you see more and more, um, technologies coming online, we all require a much more robust, you know, sort of, uh, connect connection. So as you look towards the future where, you know, there's all these new technologies, there's all these sensors, there's all this stuff running on these networks. Um, how do we ensure that we're not making a second class digital citizen, for example, because they get a low price and therefore a, a low connection, low, you know, maybe a high latency, all those type of things. Curious if you, I mean, if you have any thoughts about that. Well, I think the first thing we have to do is improve our baseline. The FCC standard for broadband right now is 25 megabits down, three megabits up. I can't even use email with that. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> we set up that standard five years ago. And I don't know about right. you, but I'm doing a whole lot more with my bandwidth <laughs> today than I was five years ago. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. That's right. I just think now that we're seeing some cable companies and others roll out DOCSIS services that are gigabit speeds, more than yeah. half the country at least has access to that infrastructure. We got to look at that baseline and adjust it upwards. I would say 100 percent, 100 megabits right now. That would be what I think is table sticks. I also mm -hmm. think we're going to have to revisit upload speeds. A lot of our um, yes, a lot of our discussion has been uh, assuming that we just consume right, like 25 megabits download is about you get in that movie watching the thing. But mm. if we're all going to move from being just consumers to creators. We're going to need upload speeds that increase too. So we got to take a hard look at that and what our infrastructure can provide. Because I think, um, I don't want to look at a world where we just think about people who get broadband as being consumers. I want to look at one where we're creators too. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these things that it, I could talk to you all day because, <laughs> you know, we're so aligned in what you're saying. And I can't tell you the number of questions that are oh. coming at me that they want to ask. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions from the audience. And, and I'll, okay, I'll I love it because it I think, as I told you in 2016, I used to live about 20 blocks from where I know. we I had it. So I, you know, years ago now, but once a New Yorker, always a New Yorker is the way I, I look at it. Right. So I, I'm <laughs> rallying for the city and you to not just recover, but develop a, you know, if this is a pause, let's reset because I think New York can be better still. Well, I appreciate you saying that. We are working really hard with the city, and including uh, putting extreme emphasis on our public housing. So we are uh, very fortunate to be working with the mayor's office and with the CTO of New York City. Um, they're listening. Uh, they're working hard, and we are right in the middle of that. So I'll keep you posted on that. Just one or two questions from the audience. I'll quickly um, repeat them, and then we'll, we'll let you get on with your day. But I can't tell you how honored I am to have you back and, and share this great insight. So one of the questions that I see is, how does the FCC think about addressing both the supply, infrastructure, connecting the last mile, and demand, affordability, adoption, size of the digital divide? This is from John Roberts. Yeah, I think um, on the supply, I think the bulk of our focus during the last four years has been on the supply and infrastructure side, figuring out how to extend networks to places where they do not reach today. I think that's good and important, but going forward, we have to spend just as much energy on adoption and affordability and try to understand why households don't adopt. Um, because we're never going to get to 100% if we don't look at both things. So that's what I think is important going forward. Okay, last question. Uh, this one is coming from Mika Hardeman. And the question is, how do we, or how do you see the potential in using fixed versus wireless connectivity and bringing people online going forward? Such a good question. Um, I'm an optimist about new technologies coming in that are going to create more competition and opportunity for all of us. I think we, I, I caught the end of what Vin Cerf was saying. And um, it was kind of a neat summary because we started in a world where we only had DSL technologies, which was remaking our phone lines. Our cable infrastructure has changed and offers most households some really fast broadband. 
as we move from 4G to 5G, we're going to see much higher speeds and lower latencies and the possibility of fixed wireless being a viable substitute. We're also seeing experimental technologies using millimeter wave spectrum, as well as new low Earth orbiting satellites. Um, I wish it was all here now because I would love if everyone could benefit from it today. But I do have some confidence that it's going to be a more diverse and competitive world tomorrow. And I think that's going to be good for consumers, for innovation and competition. And um, I think fixed wireless is going to be a part of that. Uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, am I, uh, can you hear me okay? So Absolutely. quickly, what, any final word you want to give us? Uh, I, can't, I mean, and I'm so happy you caught a little bit of Vincer, the father of the internet. <laughs> I really? Know, right? I mean, yeah. come on. I, I know, I know, but you made me go after him, which is intimidating. Um, oh, please. So, so here's the thing. I don't want us to come out of this crisis accepting that any student doesn't have access to the internet they need. So I want to make sure that you press local, state, and federal officials to end the homework gap. We should do this at national scale. There is no reason in the United States of America that kids should be sitting outside of a Taco Bell like that picture that went viral just to capture a Wi-Fi signal and go to class. We can do better. And that's not just in New York. It's all across the country. And I just would like to make it a national priority to close the homework gap. So you and I get together again. We don't even have to talk about it. That's my goal. That's my hope. I am absolutely behind you. I'd vote for you if I could. <laughs> um, whatever, whatever, wherever you're going, I'm right behind you. Thank you, all right. uh, Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel. Everyone give her a big hand. Thank you so much. There's, by the way, over 600 people have registered to see you, uh, uh, Commissioner. So thank you so much. It's an wow. uh, incredible thank impact you. that you're making. Thank you, Silicon Harlem. I really appreciate what you do. Go New York. You. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Good morning, everyone. Coming um, to you actually from our physical headquarters at Silicon Harlem at 148th Street and 8th Avenue. And uh, my name is Bruce Link, and I'm the co-founder and the chief technology officer of Silicon Harlem. And as you've heard Clayton speak to um, the focus we have, as well as how that's been supported through uh, Dr. Cerf and Commissioner Rosenworcel, we're really excited about having this virtual summit. And this is an important part of our program where we bring to you our elected officials. Quite often unsung, these tireless workers strive on our behalf. And one of their new areas of focus is ensure that we all have access to the benefits of the digital economy, to the internet. And so we're joined today by a number of our illustrious um, elected officials. So they're going to basically share remarks as they're thinking around how to advance humanity, what they're doing in this, this area. And so we're going to have Adriano Espaillat, our congressman from the 13th district join us. Inez Dickens, a state assembly person from Harlem. Ben Kalos, who's currently a city council person who's now running for borough president who comes from Silicon Alley. And Al Taylor, who's also a state assemblyman who actually represents our district where we're located. And then we're gonna be um, spoken to from the esteemed Lloyd Williams who is the head of the Greater Home Chamber of Commerce. So without further ado, I'd like to just have our um, officials begin to um, speak to us and share with the audience. I believe that um, we have Ben Kalos, who's on the call. Hi, how are you doing? I'm Council Member Ben Kalos, that's at Ben Kalos on social media, even GitHub, where we post legislation for you to uh, pull, edit, and push back so that we can write better laws. Uh, because after all, our laws are the source code of our society, of how our government operates. And as far as I know, I'm the only elected official who's also a uh, software developer. Uh, I want to start with a huge thank you to Clayton Banks, CEO of Silicon Harlem. Uh, for hosting this annual summit. That is, if it is the real Clayton and not the holographic Clayton from last year, ever since everything's virtual. I don't know if the uh, 
holographic Clayton has fully taken over. I also want to thank his partner in tech and co-founder, Bruce Lincoln. When, when the pandemic began, a lot of those with privilege began this rush to work and learn online. And many of us concerned about who we were about to leave behind. And I, I have to give credit where credit is due. Clayton reached out to me and we had a conversation about, we have this program that I worked with uh, now Attorney General Tish James to secure from Spectrum called Spectrum Internet Assist. And it said that if you're on free or reduced school lunch or supplemental income from social security, you could get 30 megabit broadband for $14.99 a month. But there are a lot of folks who aren't quite uh, at that level of poverty that ended up getting left out. And we were concerned about what would happen. So uh, working with Clayton, we reached out to Spectrum and Spectrum about 24, 48 hours later came back and said, we will make internet free uh, for the first 60 days of this pandemic to any student. Doesn't matter their income, it doesn't matter their grade, even if they're in college, we will get them that internet. And uh, they've actually renewed that offer, they've continued to offer it. And currently, as we speak, 60 days free, I believe Altice has made a similar offer. And so it, it is Silicon Harlem that is literally leading the way in this nation, uh, calling, speaking truth to power. Uh, and as we went through our city's uh, drastic budget cuts by billions, we went through the budget together and we noticed that the city of New York was planning to spend $84 million on textbooks this year at a time that we were cutting a billion dollars from the Department of Education. And it, I don't know how many other people went to public school like, like I did, but my, my textbooks were about white people from Europe, old white men. And as far as I can tell from the textbooks I've seen since I've been an elected official, our textbooks are still about white men. And that's racist. And we have these racist textbooks written for the state of Texas that don't reflect the diversity of our city. And so I, I was proud to join Clayton Banks in an op-ed that we wrote in the Daily News saying that we should take this $84 million, especially as everyone's learning online, we're not really using paper as much anymore, and create open digital materials that anyone could use, that our faculty and academics could update to reflect the history of our country, of all the men, sorry, of all the women and, and people of color who have had huge contributions that would otherwise be omitted from our textbooks. Uh, also, when the city went to get laptops, one of the things that I did with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer is it turns out the two of us had been buying laptops for everyone since the very beginning of us being elected officials. And that meant that in our schools, the kids got sent home with laptops. And the saddest part is the city spent about $250, $300 million buying iPads with 4G LTE for kids. And listen, I, I, I love gadgets and, and games as much as the next kid, but without a keyboard, that creates this gap between the kids who, who are learning with broadband and a laptop and the kids who are learning on an, on, on an internet device that doesn't even have a keyboard. So we, we work together to really hold the city accountable. And uh, I, I'm hoping that we can work with Silicon Harlem. Uh, the, the, there's an internet master plan and uh, they've said they're gonna make $157 million available. And I, I'll say before I got elected, one in four households in Brooklyn uh, didn't have broadband. One in three in the Bronx, that's pretty horrible. Uh, over the past couple of years since Internet Assist has launched, we're at uh, uh, about 22 to 13 to 22% don't have internet in the household, which is, which is a pretty dramatic change. But there's still that, that last mile of folks who haven't gotten it. And these people are low income, they're in communities of color. And one of the things that I just wanna talk about here, I'm contracts chair, my goal is to get more money into uh, women and, uh, sorry, businesses owned by women and people of color. Uh, and so why can't we take this $157 million that we're talking about, invest it into organizations that are led by black men and women and, and people of color that know the communities, that live in the communities and can get them connected. So I'm hoping we can do that. It's the right thing to do for equity. And uh, I see Bruce is back on and I'm probably over my five minutes. So I'll turn it back over to uh, Congress member Espiot, who is leading the fight 
uh, in Washington. Ben, thank you so much. Congressman, please. Uh, thank you all the, for all the participants, particularly for the, the, the students that are on, uh, that are part of my app challenge uh, for Washington. And so uh, we're, we're looking um, at great challenges. Every great crisis, uh, and, um, and undoubtedly the, the COVID-19 pandemic has been the biggest crisis of our lifetime. Every great crisis also will bring about a great opportunities uh, to move forward. And, and this has been a horrible crisis. Uh, uh, close to 220,000 people have died, uh, 7 million plus uh, have tested positive. Uh, we, we're sort of like bracing for a second phase of the pandemic. Uh, we have the flu um, season upon us. Uh, we have unemployment. We have businesses uh, struggling to open up and shutting down. Uh, so this is a truly a, 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 a the crisis of our lifetimes, but it also provides uh, great opportunities for us to reinvent ourselves, uh, better, stronger, more resilient. And, uh, and I think that uh, the crisis has, in fact, uh, once again, revealed what many of us already knew, that our communities are disconnected and that, in fact, we have a disparity. We have a, a, a huge gap in access to, to Wi-Fi, to broadband. And so it is imperative that we work together in making sure that we have a major, major initiative, uh, an infrastructure project that will include not just rural, but urban broadband, 5G, that we begin to connect all of our neighborhoods, particularly those that have been traditionally uh, been disenfranchised, uh, uh, to connect them, to ensure that in the future, children will be able to uh, uh, access and benefit from distance learning. That the healthcare system, which is now transitioning to telehealth, will ensure that uh, seniors will be able to uh, contact their doctor without having to go to their local offices, practices, and, and be able to uh, have the healthcare that they need. Uh, but that also small businesses reinvent themselves in a competitive way. A small businesses will now rely more and more on technology uh, to provide goods and services. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, the pandemic also revealed that our businesses are not really at that level. They're not as competitive as they should be. And so this is the great challenge of our lifetime. We must invest the dollars. It should be a $1 trillion to $1.5 trillion dollar initiative of infrastructure projects that will ensure that uh, we not only um, reinvent our rural bridges and, and tunnels, but also that we do it in a smart way uh, that with the state-of-the-art technology that brings us to another level. Now, I have been working with former Congressman Charlie Rangel in establishing the uh, at City College, the Institute for uh, infrastructure and transportation. Now, transportation and infrastructure is no longer the traditional uh, field where you had the Sandhogs digging out the Second Avenue subway. Uh, it is highly complex and techno technological. And so we must train the workforce for uh, the, these major projects, uh, the gateway uh, uh, tunnel, the, the, um, the, the second phase of the Second Avenue subway, uh, the airports that are being built across the state. Uh, so th these are all very important projects for our economy and our region. And we must have the workforce trained uh, for them to be very successful. And that, in that requires, of course, uh, training in the latest technology, access to broadband, 5G, and the latest opportunities in the highway, in the technological highway that's available today. So uh, I want to thank the three students that are on the call that are part of my app challenge. Uh, thank you for participating. And this is the first year that we're doing it. We're going to continue to do it in collaboration with Silicon Harlem. And I want to thank you all for being part of this conversation. This, this um, uh, juncture, this crossroad that we're facing of historic proportions will determine really the future of our nation. 
And you are the protagonist. You are the leaders that will make it happen. Thank you so much and keep the faith. Thank you, Clayton, for your leadership as well, Bruce. Thank you so much, Congressman. And your tireless work doesn't go unsung. Oh, man. Thank God for you guys. Oh, my goodness. And what you teach and do. I've been circling in orbit somewhere for like 12 minutes um, because I wanted to be early and I got into something and it says uh, virtual Silicon Harlem and I'm sitting here like there's nobody here but me and my staff is calling me like where are you I'm like I'm here with all this apparatus and um, I can certainly appreciate what you all are doing and have done uh, again good morning all especially to Clayton and Bruce thank you for the tireless efforts that you do um, not only for our community, but for this state and this nation. Um, and I just before I, I read my statement that I have put together, I just want to thank you all for the tireless work that you've done, especially the blessing that you guys were able to help with um, providing over, uh, I don't know, hundreds of thermometers to folks when we did the back to school. And I just saw a, a photo, Clayton, the other day in the last three days, and you were literally uh, lifting and putting these boxes into a vehicle. So I, I can't thank you enough. So you're not just tech, tech savvy. You're physically fit to do the job as well. So thank you again for all that you do. Um, I want to read a little bit of what I've prepared um, for this morning. Um, never in our lifetime have we seen such um, issues as we're facing this pandemic, uh, COVID-19, um, how critical technology and digital, digital infrastructure has become in um, our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I don't have to tell you how this pandemic has unpended life as we know it. This health crisis has affected each and every one of us. Since March, we've seen a dramatic shift in how we do business, how our kids are educated, how we interact with each other. Um, some offices have shifted their workplaces online. Uh, many schools are operating remotely. Um, meetings that used to take place in person now happen via Zoom, Skype, and other digital platforms, such as what we're doing this morning. Um, we started to even buy the basic necessities to avoid risking exposure. Um, and we go out less and less um, because we do more and more FaceTime and telecommunication as well. All of this is only possible thanks to the advancements we've made in technology on online platforms. On the flip side, everyone excluded from this digital revolution, we'll have time fighting to catch up. I just want to add, even here, when uh, Clayton and I first started speaking some years, the fact that we were already on unequal footing um, in this pandemic totally exposed that. You were setting that alarm well in advance, at least for me, I understood it back then. And hopefully we can get national and um, state and local legislation that will start to um, make it a reality. I, I think one of the things I recall you saying was that it's not a luxury and every home needs this in order to just be relevant. So thank you again. Uh, many New Yorkers don't have the luxury of working from home. Um, during this pandemic, you have our essential workers who continue and continue to go out serving the communities while putting their own health risk um, and well-being um, at stake. And even their home, um, coming home with the possibility of infecting their families as they went out and worked day in and day out tirelessly. Many others have no choice and were forced to make impossible decisions because they could not continue working or if they continue working, they ran that risk. But if they stopped working, it would take away income, the only source of income. So um, their paycheck was a lifeline through all of this and they worked. Um, we have lost over 200,000 souls during this pandemic, uh, over 200,000. And sadly, it's starting to peak and it's not over yet. And as we implement new measures to stay safe and keep our communities healthy, technology will play a bigger and bigger role in all our lives. In the 21st century, one of the keys to advancing humanity and advancing disadvantaged communities is digital inclusion. And this 
year has shown that needs to be a priority <clears throat> across the board. Um, this is no longer an abstract problem or an issue we can fix by you know, kicking the can down the road and doing it tomorrow. When all classes went remote across New York City, the Department of Education had to connect hundreds of thousands of students with devices so they could continue their studies from home. Thousands of students had to be reissued devices with remote hotspot connectivity because their living situation did not have Wi-Fi or internet access, internet access available. In such a digital connected world, we have to do better by our youth and by our seniors. We have to do better by our communities. Technology and digital platforms hold all the potential to be incredible, life-changing tools. We have to use technology to bridge the gaps that exist between the haves and the have-nots. As government representatives, we have the power to support technology to support technology businesses. In e-commerce, we have the power to help our schools receive the funding and technology they need to usher future generations into technology-driven future. We also have the power to ensure the future is inclusive. Inclusive, we have the power to ensure every child has access to technology and resources that only exist and didn't happen during our ancestors' wildest dreams. That's why I'm thrilled to support the social um, ventures like Silicon Harlem, which has committed to giving back to our communities through focusing on crucial infrastructure needs. Silicon Harlem is a groundbreaking tech and innovation hub dedicated to growing Upper Manhattan's tech ecosystem through increasing broadband access, expanding digital literacy, and launching a revolutionary smart city, smart community initiative. And in closing, I wanna say closing this digital gap and getting our neighborhoods online opens so many doors for our communities from jobs to healthcare services to educational tools. Technology has given so many the opportunity of upward mobility in society. And I would like to thank Silicon Harlem um, for giving our communities such as Harlem and New York City and the state as a whole a much needed leg up so we of all ages can benefit from this wave of technology. And <clears throat> we all come stronger, when we all come out stronger once we overcome this terrible health crisis. And again, I just wanna thank you and Bruce, Clayton, you and Bruce and your team for all that you do and uh, being a visionary. Thank you guys so much. And I'm available for questions or I follow directions very well, Nelson. Thank you very much, Assemblyman. That was a, a cogent set of remarks and very key to what is important.